In short, the historical and logical case for concluding that the 14th Amendment incorporates the excessive fines clause is overwhelming. Protection against excessive punitive economic sanctions secured by the clause is, to repeat, both fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty and deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Meanwhile, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would like to have a word with you. This is Tyson Timms, petitioner, versus the state of Indiana in the Supreme Court of the United States on writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court of Indiana. Justice Ginsburg delivers the opinion of the court. This is fairly short, so bear with me. I think you'll enjoy this. You've all heard of civil asset forfeiture. Let's find out what is happening to it now. Tyson Timms pleaded guilty in Indiana State Court to dealing in a controlled substance and conspiracy to commit theft. The trial court sentenced him to one year of home detention, five years of probation, which included a court-supervised addiction treatment program. The sentence also required Tim's to pay fees and costs totaling $1,203. At the time of his arrest, the police seized his vehicle, a Land Rover SUV Tim's had purchased for about $42,000. Tim's paid for the vehicle with money he received from an insurance policy when his father died. So that's important. The vehicle was not purchased with uh, proceeds or ill-gotten gains from criminal activity. The state engaged a private law firm to bring a civil suit for forfeiture of Tim's Land Rover, charging that the vehicle had been used to transport heroin. After Tim's guilty plea in the criminal case, the trial court held a hearing on the forfeiture demand. Although finding that Tim's vehicle had been used to facilitate violation of a criminal statute, the court denied the requested forfeiture, observing that Tim's had recently purchased the vehicle for 42 thousand dollars, more than four times the maximum ten thousand dollar monetary fine accessible against him for his drug conviction. Forfeiture of the Land Rover, the court determined, would be grossly disproportionate to the gravity of Tim's offense, hence unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause. The Eighth Amendment is the amendment that prohibits excessive fines and penalties. The Court of Appeals of Indiana affirmed that determination, but the Indiana Supreme Court reversed. The Supreme Court of Indiana did not decide whether the forfeiture would be excessive. Instead, it held that the excessive fines clause constrains only federal action and is inapplicable to state impositions. We granted certiorari which means the Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear the case. And then they're going to phrase it in their normal way, a question presented. Like, what is the question that we are addressing? The question presented is the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause and incorporated protection applicable to the states under the 14th Amendment's due process clause. This is, this, is, this is a very important distinction. There's a lot going on here. The Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution did not automatically apply to the states. However, there's another amendment called the 14th Amendment that applies the Fifth Amendment's due process clause to the states. So the federal law applies to the states now. So the question here is, does, does the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on excessive fines apply to the states? The answer is yes, it does. And we're going to explain all that. Like the Eighth Amendment's prescriptions of cruel and unusual punishment and excessive bail, proscription meaning prohibition, the protection against excessive fines guards against abuses of government's punitive or criminal law enforcement authority. This safeguard we hold is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty. With deep roots in our history and tradition, the excessive fines clause is therefore incorporated by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. This is stuff that's like right out of a bar exam or, or a law school course's final exam. Like, by the way, how would this constitutional right apply in this new situation? This is the kind of thing you would see on a bar exam or a, or a constitutional law course's final exam. When ratified in 1791, the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. 
the constitutional amendments adopted in the aftermath of the Civil War fundamentally altered the country's federal system. With only a handful of exceptions, this court has held that the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause incorporates, that's a very important word, incorporates the protections contained in the Bill of Rights, rendering them applicable to the states. Major law school concept there, major concept of federalism, the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause incorporates the Bill of Rights protections as against the states. A Bill of Rights protection is incorporated, we have explained, if it is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty or deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Incorporated Bill of Rights guarantees are enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect these personal rights against federal encroachment. Thus, if a Bill of Rights protection is incorporated, there is no daylight between the federal and state conduct it prohibits or requires. <laughs> I, I, love, I love Judge Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg's language there. There is no daylight. There is no space. There is no gap between federal and state conduct. Under the Eighth Amendment, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted, Justice Scalia. Remember, Justice Scalia was the justice that said that torture is not cruel and unusual punishment, and therefore not prohibited by the Eighth Amendment because it is not punishment. I disagree, but let's let's back off of my disagreement there. We're talking about civil asset forfeiture. Taken together, these clauses place parallel limitations on the power of those entrusted with the criminal law function of government. Directly at issue here is the phrase, nor excessive fines imposed, which limits the government's power to extract payments, whether in cash or in kind, as punishment for some offense. The 14th Amendment we hold incorporates this protection. The Excessive Fines Clause traces its venerable lineage back to at least 1215, when Magna Carta... We get to actually use the Magna Carta correctly here, Edward Thomas Kennedy. When Magna Carta guaranteed that a free man shall not be immersed for a small fault, but after the manner of the fault, and for a great fault after the greatness thereof, saving to him his contentment. Con contentment, yeah, contentment. As relevant here, Magna Carta required, and I, I, I like the phrasing, I did not realize it is not the Magna Carta, it is Magna Carta. As relevant here, Magna Carta required that economic sanctions be proportioned to the wrong and not be so large as to deprive an offender of his livelihood. No man shall have a larger immersement imposed upon him than his circumstances or personal estate will bear. Taking no position in this one case, uh, I'm going to guess it's Bayakayan. By, by a Kayan? I don't know. Uh, taking no position on the question whether a person's income and wealth are relevant consideration in judging the excessiveness of a fine. Despite Magna Carta, imposition of excessive fines persisted. The 17th century Stuart kings, in particular, were criticized for using large fines to raise revenue, harass their political foes, and indefinitely detain those unable to pay. By the way, uh, the Mary Queen of Scots was a halfway decent movie, especially if you are into that sort of history, decent, wor decent worth watching. However, if you're not into that kind of thing, not really a movie for, for me, you know, but, uh, you know, it was, it was okay. It was watchable. When James II was overthrown in the Glorious Revolution, the attendant English Bill of Rights reaffirmed Magna Carta's guarantee by providing that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And that's from 1689. Look at that. The language from 1689 is nearly identical to our language in the Eighth Amendment. Bill of Rights from 1789, I think it was, 
1791, 89, I think it was 89. Across the Atlantic, this familiar language was adopted almost verbatim, first in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, then in the Eighth Amendment, which states excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Adoption of the excessive fines clause was in tune not only with English law, the clause resonated as well with similar colonial era provisions. Um, all fines shall be moderate and saving men's contentments, merchandise, or wainage in the PA frame of government laws agreed upon in England. I don't know if PA is Pennsylvania, but that sounds pretty cool. In 1787, the constitutions of eight states, accounting for 70% of the population, forbade excessive fines. An even broader consensus obtained in, 16, in 1868 upon ratification of the 14th Amendment. By then, the constitutions of the 35 of 37 states, accounting for 90% of the U.S. population, expressly prohibited excessive fines. Notwithstanding, the state's apparent agreement that the right guaranteed by the excessive fines clause was fundamental, abuses continued. Following the Civil War, southern states enacted black codes to subjugate newly freed slaves and maintain the pre-war racial hierarchy. Among these laws' provisions were draconian fines for violating broad proscriptions on vagrancy and other dubious offenses. When newly freed slaves were unable to pay imposed fines, states often demanded involuntary labor instead. Uh, C. Finkelman, John Bingham, and the background of the 14th Amendment describing Black Code's use of fines and other methods to replicate as much as possible a system of involuntary servitude. Congressional debates over the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the joint resolution that became the 14th Amendment, and similar measures repeatedly mentioned the use of fines to coerce involuntary labor. Today, acknowledgement of the right's fundamental nature remains widespread. As Indiana itself reports, all 50 states have a constitutional provision prohibiting the imposition of excessive fines either directly or by requiring proportionality. Indeed, Indiana explains that its own Supreme Court has held that the Indiana Constitution should be interpreted to impose the same restrictions as the Eighth Amendment. For good reason, the protection against excessive fines has been a constant shield throughout Anglo-American history. Exorbitant tolls undermine other constitutional liberties. Excessive fines can be used, for example, to retaliate against or chill the speech of political enemies, as the Stuarts' critics learned several centuries ago. Even absent a political motive, fines may be employed in a measure out of accord with the penal goals of retribution and deterrence. Four fines are a source of revenue, while other forms of punishment cost a state money. It makes sense to scrutinize governmental action more closely when the state stands to benefit. This concern is scarcely hypothetical, perhaps because they are politically easier to impose than generally applicable taxes. State and local governments nationwide increasingly depend heavily on fines and fees as a source of general revenue. In short, the historical and logical case for concluding that the 14th Amendment incorporates the excessive fines clause is overwhelming. Protection against excessive punitive economic sanctions secured by the clause is, to repeat, both fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty and deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. The state of Indiana does not meaningfully challenge the case for incorporating the excessive fines clause as a general matter. Instead, the state argues that the clause does not apply to its use of civil in rem forfeitures because, the state says, the clause's specific application to such forfeitures is neither fundamental nor deeply rooted. So what they're saying in by what the state of Indiana is arguing is that this is a civil asset forfeiture, which if you're not not aware of how these work they are particularly uh, shady they don't sue you they sue the thing it's the United States against a $42,000 Land Rover not the United States against Leonard French who owns a $42,000 Land Rover that we're trying to get to no it's United States versus a bundle of $10,000 in cash you know and so then this then the state the, the government argues that they're not suing a person, so therefore a person's civil rights don't apply. Well, yes, they do, apparently. 
In Austin v. United States, 1993 Supreme Court case, this court held that civil in rem against the thing forfeitures fall within the clause's protection when they are at least partially punitive. Austin arose in the federal context, but when a Bill of Rights protection is incorporated, the protection applies identically both to the federal government and the states. Accordingly, to prevail, Indiana must persuade us either to overrule our decision in Austin or to hold that in light of Austin, the excessive fines clause is not incorporated because the clause's application to civil in rem forfeitures is neither fundamental nor deeply rooted. The first argument is not properly before us, and the second misapprehends the nature of our incorporation inquiry. In the Indiana Supreme Court, the state argued that the forfeiture of Tim's SUV would not be excessive. It never argued, however, that civil in rem forfeitures were categorically beyond the reach of the excessive fines clause. The Indiana Supreme Court, for its part, held that the clause did not apply to the states at all, and it nowhere addressed the clause's application to civil in rem forfeitures. Accordingly, Tim's sought our review of the question whether the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause is incorporated against the states under the 14th Amendment. In opposing review, Indiana attempted to reformulate the question to ask whether the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause restricts states' use of civil asset forfeitures. And on the merits, Indiana has argued not only that the clause is not incorporated, but also that Austin was wrongly decided. Respondents write in their brief of opposition to restate the questions presented, however, does not give them the power to expand those questions. That is particularly the case where, as here, a respondent's reformulation would lead us to address a question neither pressed nor passed upon below. We are a court of review, not a court of first review. We thus decline the state's invitation to reconsider our unanimous judgment in Austin that civil in rem forfeitures are fines for the purposes of the Eighth Amendment when they are at least partially punitive. As a fallback, Indiana argues that the excessive fines clause cannot be incorporated if it applies to civil in rem forfeitures. We disagree. In considering whether the 14th Amendment incorporates a protection contained in the Bill of Rights, we ask whether the right guaranteed not each each and every particular application of that right is fundamentally or deeply rooted. Indiana's suggestion to the contrary is inconsistent with the approach we have taken in cases concerning novel applications of rights already deemed incorporated. For example, in Packingham versus North Carolina, we held that a North Carolina statute prohibiting registered sex offenders from accessing certain commonplace social media websites violated the First Amendment right to freedom of speech. In reaching this conclusion, we noted that the First Amendment's free speech clause was applicable to the states under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. We did not, however, inquire whether the Free Speech Clause's application specifically to social media websites was fundamental or deeply rooted. See also Raleigh v. California, holding, without separately considering incorporation, that state's warrantless search of digital information stored on cell phones ordinarily violates the Fourth Amendment. Similarly here, regardless of whether application of the excessive fines clause to civil in rem forfeitures is itself fundamental or deeply rooted, our conclusion that the clause is incorporated remains unchanged. For the reasons stated above, the judgment of the Indiana Supreme Court is vacated, and this case is remanded for further proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion. It is so ordered by the notorious RBG. That is a neat opinion. I believe uh, this was also unanimous, though, wasn't it? This was also at least unanimous. Uh, yeah, Ger well, Gersuch is, 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 incorpor uh, is, yeah, is incorporating, is consenting. Um, Thomas consents. Let's see here. There's nine Supreme Court justices, right? Yeah, and Blackleaf is saying it was unanimous. So, I mean, yeah. I love RBG. So, like, she has my heart. But I also wanted to say that G Ginsburg, both the conservative and the liberal uh, justices three, were four, everybody. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, that's all nine of them. Uh, nine. So yeah, that's all nine justices agreed. <laughs> so this is so they did not actually say that in rem forfeitures were automatically void. However, the language if you to get there is that an in rem or civil forfeiture against a thing would fall under an excessive fines clause if it was punitive in any way. 
So as long as it's not punitive, they can still do civil asset forfeitures. But the moment it becomes punitive in nature, this applies to them, and they can only grab things that are not considered an excessive uh, fine. So it's not the end of civil asset forfeitures, but it's a giant limitation on it. And it seems like a reasonable limitation to me. Yeah. Now, somebody in the comments had uh, a really interesting question, and that's um, whether court fees and lawyers' fees can be awarded in cases like this. Because in a lot of uh, civil cases, if you are the prevailing party, you can ask the other side to pay your legal fees. Mm. But in this case, because it's against a state and because it went all the way to the Supreme Court, would you have any access to that? You might not have access to legal fees in a case like this. Um, so this is the difference between the American rule and the English rule. As much as when we talk about copyright law, I like to talk about recovering fees. There's a law for that. 17 U.S.C. 505 is a law that allows you to recover attorney's fees for the prevailing party in a copyright case. The general rule in America is that you don't recover your attorney's fees. Whether it be against the United States or the state government or a local government, you go, you get a BS traffic ticket, you're not recovering your attorney's fees. Um, heck, even if you get charged with murder and you turn out to be innocent, you're not recovering your attorney's fees. There has to be something more. There has to be some kind of misconduct in the case or some withholding of evidence, exonerating evidence from, you know, the, the, the prosecutor withholds evidence and doesn't give it to the defense when they learn about exonerating evidence. That kind of thing maybe can be recovered. But in general, you don't recover your fees and costs so no you just this guy may have spent well more than 20 than forty two thousand dollars to get this truck back and may not um may not recover any of those funds I, I think there's there's some arguments to be made that maybe the law was really clear and maybe indiana was supposed to know this and look at how it's a nine to zero decision like there should have been no question that maybe there you argue there's some kind of misconduct or some kind of uh recovery available there it's not automatic also, he's a goddamn hero for bringing this all the way to the Supreme Court and getting this judgment. Yeah, they're the lawyers too, because when you're sitting there as a lawyer, you, you, a lot of times you're saying, "I just, I just want to go back to prosecuting cases or defending cases. I really don't want to be involved in a Supreme Court appeal. Like, I'm going to be doing the Supreme Court appeal and nothing else." So, <laughs> a lot of times, even the lawyer doesn't really want to do it, and it's just a matter of, uh, yeah. you know, and I mean, finding the resources you know, for it. If the lawyer was competent, he would have told the guy, hey, listen, you're not getting your money back. Like, if you take this all to the Supreme Court, this is a principal matter. You need to understand that. And the guy had to have been like, I understand, but I still think that this is ridiculous and we need to get this to stop happening. Yeah. So, like I said, he's a goddamn hero. I mean, there, there might have been like a civil rights group or something that, uh, that might have backed this fight. That's all I have for you today. Let me say the outro here and thank all of our Patreon supporters. Uh, this channel mostly, well, especially now with the fifth adpocalypse, this channel exists mostly due to your Patreon support. That money that you give us helps us buy equipment, helps us pay Tactical and Brandon. Um, helps offset the time that I spend working on the videos. I apologize. Last week, we didn't have the four videos that I thought because I screwed up the audio and didn't have a chance to reshoot at a very busy week. But that will that's just an anomaly. We expect that this week we'll be back to normal and doing three or four videos at least. No problem. So let's call Nico in here for a visit while I thank our $50 plus supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench. Uh, for the month of February, thank you very much to Jacob Papenfuss, who I forgot about last week, and I really apologize for that. Thank you to Jonathan Doe, Jonathan Steele, or just John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mentane, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negray, Daniel Perez, and of course, again, Jacob Papenfuss. And all of you are scrolling on the LED panel back there. Uh, we need to do some upgrades. We need to do some things, like a new 
LED panel, maybe some green screen stuff. I have a short video that I want to write. It's a scripted video or I want to finish writing and uh, and produce with all sorts of visuals and animations on it. So uh, all this is very exciting. I think we still have to finish Cambridge Analytica and still have to finish Justin Rogers video as well. And so I'm looking very much forward to getting all that finished shortly here as we are back to a more normal schedule since I don't have to go to court last Friday or this coming Wednesday and um, and things are calming down. Anyway, love you all. I will look into Ewan's article about uh, Chinese merchants and how I could take advantage of e-packets. I have a feeling it doesn't apply to me anyway. Lawful Masses sketch comedy is on the horizon. Believe it or not, I do have a local improv troupe that I used to be a part of, and we might be able to hire them as actors to reenact some of the more comedic situations that we find ourselves talking about. Uh, keep that in mind, because I'm not done with this. This is not the this is not the plateau. This is not the final version. This is not my final form of the Lawful Masses. Uh, legal education channel. I want to say YouTube channel, but it's more than just YouTube. Anyway, love you all. Give me a dog. I want a dog. Ilsa, Ilsa, come here, my Ilsa. Ilsa, hop. Ilsa, hop. Yes, you are. No, hop. You have to come hop. You have to come hop and say hi. No, don't jump on her. Nico, hop. Yes, there you go. Yay. So thank you for joining me, everyone. I'm going to leave the stream without a musical outro, and that way Brandon can have a slightly easier time adding a musical outro later. Also, it saves me a step. So love you all. Have a great week. We will drop most of these videos this week, assuming that my audio is much better than it was last week. So have a great weekend, everybody. I'll see you in the videos and and the Discord. Don't forget to join us on Discord as well. Love you. Bye.